Okay, welcome back. Today's lecture is on t a t-test for independent means. Um, so we've now learned two different types of t-tests, and this will be our third. So in general, a t-test is a hypothesis testing procedure in which the population variance is unknown. We've previously learned that we can do a single sample t-test. This is where we take a mean from our sample and we're going to compare that to a known population mean mu or some other logical comparison value. And again, when we don't know the population variance, sigma squared is unknown. We've also learned in a previous lecture how to do a t-test for dependent means. We use a t-test for dependent means where we've got two scores from each person and the population variance is unknown. And what we do is we create a different score or a change score, and this becomes a, a single group of change scores. Ultimately, what, what we're doing is we're looking at the mean change or the average amount of change, and we compare that to a known population mean, which is assumed to be zero. So we use a t-test for dependent means when we have a research situation where we're getting two scores from people either before and after an intervention, or you could think of a pretest and a post-test, we calculate the difference between those two scores and we're testing whether the average difference between a pretest and a post-test or before and after score is different than zero. Okay. So the next t-test that we're gonna learn is a t-test for independent means. It's sometimes called a t-test for independent samples. This is a hypothesis testing procedure that compares the means of two separate, otherwise known as independent samples for which the population variance is not known. An independent means t-test is used when we have a between subjects design in contrast to a within subject design. With our t-test for dependent means, we had a within subject design or a repeated measures design where we got two measurements or two observations from the same person. With a between subjects design, we only get a single observation and we're gonna get that single observation from two different groups of people. So a t-test for independent means is the most common t-test that is used in research as well as applied practice situations. So for example, this is very common to use in an experimental design where we're gonna look at the difference between an experimental treatment versus a control or an experimental manipulation versus a group that did not receive the experimental manipulation or to look at the difference between naturally occurring groups like boys versus girls or men versus women. So ultimately, this is some sort of a research situation in which we're comparing means from two different groups. So I'm gonna show some diagrams in this lecture as well as in subsequent lectures. And so we can kind of think of getting data from two different samples and these samples represent two different groups of people. So again, this could be um, one group that receives a treatment and one group that doesn't, or you could have one group that is boys and another group that is girls. Our sample data provides estimates of our, of our two different populations. So we can view each of our samples as reflecting um, the mean variance and standard deviation of the populations from which they're drawn or sampled. Um, what we also have with the t-test for independent means are also distributions of means. So similar to a single sample t-test and a t-test for dependent means, what we're asking with our distribution of means is what would happen over the long run if we repeatedly sampled from a population with known characteristics. That is, if we know the mean and the variance of this population and we take repeated samples of a particular size, 
what will that distribution of means look like? With a t-test for independent means, we have two populations, so we have two distributions of means. Each one of these distribution of means reflects a repeated sampling process from its, we could say, parent population. The new conceptual entity that we have with a t-test for independent means is something called a distribution of differences between means. So this is a, a hypothetical or a conceptual distribution, and it represents the difference between a mean that I could sample from this distribution and a mean that I could sample from this distribution. So we can think about, let me randomly sample a mean from this distribution of means, and then I'll randomly sample a mean from this distribution of means, I'll subtract one from the other, that is I'll calculate the difference, and then I'll put that difference in this pile, okay? And if I do that over and over and over again, I'll get a distribution of differences between means. And it's this distribution of differences between means that forms the basis for our comparison distribution when we are doing our hypothesis testing. So more about that in just a little bit. All right, All right, so I guess, as in little bit, bit means right now. So distribution of differences between means. So we can think of this as a distribution of different scores for randomly selected means from the two distribution of means that are formed from randomly sampling from their parent populations. It's created by randomly selecting one mean from each distribution of means, calculating the difference between them, and then repeating this over and over again. The, the resulting, the result is a distribution of differences between means. If the null hypothesis is true, okay, and our null hypothesis is that there's no difference, there's no difference between the two populations. So for example, if we're doing some sort of a, a treatment, let's just say it's a new therapy, the null hypothesis would suggest that the therapy does not work. And so there's no difference between the population of people that received the therapy and the population of people that did not. So under the null hypothesis, both of those populations have the same mean. Therefore, each distribution of means that is based on those parent populations also has the same mean. And therefore, the mean of the distribution of differences between means should be zero. So that is, over the long run, if we're randomly sampling from each of those populations, and then we're randomly sampling from each of those distribution of, of means, if each of those distribution of means has the same mean, we expect that the distribution of mean differences should be centered around a mean of zero. So the goal of the t-test is to decide whether the difference between any two sample means that we get is extreme enough to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? So whether the difference that we observe between two sample means is so large that it would go beyond our cutoff score on our comparison distribution, the comparison distribution being the distribution of differences between means. All right. So again, let's just look at this diagram again. What we're gonna do is use sample data from each of our two samples to estimate the population variance. So we're gonna get an estimate of population variance for population one and an estimate of population variance for, po for population two. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to come up with an estimate of pooled variance. So pooled variance is a new term when calculating the t-test for independent means. What a pooled variance is, is essentially a weighted average of the estimate of variance for population one and population two. The assumption of a t-test for independent means is that each population has an equivalent variance. Right, that is just one simplifying assumption that the creators of this t-test needed to make. 
Okay, so the assumption of doing the test is that the, the variance in population one is equal to the variance in population two. Under that assumption, the idea is that if we're supposed to be getting estimates of a population variance, which, which is the same, we're going to pool those estimates together to have a more stable estimate, to have a more um, consistent estimate of what that population variance should be. So that's, a, that's, a, that's called a pooled estimate of variance. Okay. And that pooled estimate of variance then becomes our best guess of the variance for population one and, and population two. Okay, so we're going to just basically use all the information that we have in order to come up with this pooled estimate of variance. We then use that pooled estimate of variance to estimate the variance of the distribution of means. And we calculate the variance of the distribution of means using our same um, formula that we've that we've been using. So this ultimately derives from rule, rule 2a. This comes from the central limit theorem where we're just taking our population variance and dividing by the sample size and that will give us the variance of the distribution of means. Now it's important to come up with two different estimates for each of these two different distributions of means because we can have different size samples. So if our first sample is of a particular size and our second sample is of a different size, we know that we're going to have a different estimate of variance in each of our distribution of means because of rule 2a, which is that we divide the our estimate of population variance by n, which is sample size. So we need to do that for each one. We then determine the variance of our distribution of mean differences and we're going to do that by adding the variance from our first distribution of means to the variance of our second distribution of means. Once we have the variance of the distribution of mean differences, we take the square root to get the standard deviation of this distribution of mean differences, which is ultimately our standard error. That standard error tells us how much of a difference we can expect just due to random sampling error. Okay, So that's the bottom of our t-test. The top of our t-test, what we're doing is we're evaluating how big of a difference we see between our two sample means relative to how much of a difference we would expect. All right, so this part would suggest that if under the, the null hypothesis, both of our populations have an equivalent mean, then each one of our distribution of means should be centered around that mean, right? so that the mean of the distribution of means for population one should be equal to the mean of the distribution of means for population two. So what we expect is that there shouldn't be a difference. So we all, we're ultimately just going to drop that term out, okay? because we expect that the mean of the distribution of means for population one and population two should be equivalent. There should be no difference. So what we're doing is we're evaluating how big is the difference between sample one, the mean of sample one and the mean of sample two, relative to the, the zero difference that we were expecting. So that is how much does the difference that we observe differ or deviate from the difference that we expected, which was zero. Okay, so the short of it is we can simplify our T formula. And what we're doing is we're going to evaluate the difference that we observe between mean one and mean two based on the standard error of the difference. That is the average amount of difference that we would expect via a random sampling process. So it is a somewhat complicated statistic to kind of think about conceptually is, is how do we get there. But, um, Ultimately, if you can think of it as we're evaluating what is the difference that we're observing between these two sample means relative to how big of a difference I would expect just due to random chance or random sampling error. Okay. So the process is to come up with an estimate of population variance from each sample. And we do that by taking our raw data 
calculating some of the sum of square differences from the mean, dividing by degrees of freedom. Um, definitely review the previous lectures for, for how to do that from, from raw data, but here's our, the formulas that we're used to working with. Once we've come up with an estimate of population variance, one for population one and one for population two, we're going to pool those estimates together. Okay, And again, this is the, the logic here is that because both estimated variances are supposed to be estimating the same population variance, okay, that is an assumption of doing this test, is that the population variance for both populations is the same then pooling that is averaging them together will give us the best estimate of what that population variance ought to be. And to do this pooling procedure, we simply take the weighted average of our two estimates. Okay. So we're gonna take our two estimates of population variance and we're gonna weight them by degrees of freedom. Recall that degrees of freedom is sample size minus one. So in essence, what we're saying is we're gonna take a weighted average of our estimate of population variance based on the sample size. The next thing that we're gonna do is estimate the variances of the distribution of means. That's done by taking that pooled estimate of variance, dividing by the sample size from our first sample, taking that exact same estimate of, of pooled variance and dividing by the sample size from our second sample. So that gives us the variance of the distribution of means for population one and the variance of distribution of means for population two. We're then gonna add the variance of the, each of the distribution of means to get the variance of the distribution of mean differences, okay, which is just designated by the variance of the of the difference. Okay, that's a shorthand for saying the variance of the distribution mean differences, which is kind of a mouthful. This is based on a mathematical property called the variance sum law, which says that the variance of a sum or difference of two independent variables is equal to the sum of their variances. So ultimately, we want the variance of the difference between mean one and mean two. So our variance sum law says, all we need to do is take the sum of their variances, the variance of the distribution of mean one for mean one, the distribution of means for means two, add them together, and that will give us the variance of the difference between the two. So we're gonna use that variance sum law, and then we calculate our t-statistic as the difference between mean one and mean two divided by the standard error of the difference, which we get by taking the square root of the variance of the distribution of mean differences. Okay, so ultimately what we're asking is whether the difference betwe between our two sample means is large enough to conclude that it's unlikely to be from a distribution of differences between means that has a mean of zero. So under the null hypothesis, if if our means are being sampled from populations that have an identical um, population mean mu, when we do this random sampling process, ultimately our distribution of mean differences should be centered around a difference of zero. Okay. So what we're saying is, would, the, dip, would, the, would our, the difference between the two means that we observe be considered unlikely to fall in that distribution under the null hypothesis. All right, so let's do an example, which will hopefully um, make this a little bit more concrete. I understand it's been very conceptual up until now. So we'll do a applied example and, and use some numbers. All right, so here's our example. We have observed clinically that aggressive children have trouble generating solutions to difficult interpersonal problems, which is true. Okay, so there's our aggressive kid. And so we're gonna design a study comparing how many effective solutions aggressive kids can generate compared to non-aggressive kids. So here's our two groups. We've got aggressive kids and we've got non-aggressive kids. Okay, we can create a study and in that study, we'll have these two different groups or two different samples but ultimately, 
we're interested in making conclusions at the level of populations. So a population of aggressive children and a population of um, non-aggressive children. All right. So we do our study and our sample of aggressive children has 26 kids. On average, they were able to generate um, five solutions. And then let's just say that from our, our 26 kids, there's obviously not every single one of them was able to generate five. There's going to be some variance there. So we've taken that, that data and I've calculated for you what our estimate of the population variance is. Okay. I've done that too with our non-aggressive kids. So there's 36. Let's just say on average, they were able to come up with eight solutions to interpersonal problems. And then here's the estimate of population variance that would come from their data. So I'm not showing you all the data that is associated with these 26 kids or these 36 kids. We just got the, um, the mean and estimate of population variance have already been calculated for you. So the question is, are aggressive kids significantly worse at generating effective solutions? So we see from this research question that if we translate this into a hypothesis, we've got a directional hypothesis here. Okay, we just take that research question and we turn it into a prediction, which is that aggressive kids are significantly worse at generating effective solutions than non-aggressive kids. All right, so let's go through our steps of hypothesis testing. Step one, we're gonna re restate our question as a research hypothesis about populations. Population one we'll call aggressive kids and population two we'll call non-aggressive kids. This is kind of arbitrary, who's specified as, as one and two, but I could kind of think of the aggressive kids as being similar to our convention of um, like receiving something or receiving a treatment. And so they're kind of like a population of interest in a way. So our convention is that that treated population is population one. But in, in truth, it's, it's kind of arbitrary, but we need to pay attention to who's one and who's two for the purposes of stating our predictions correctly. So our alternative hypothesis, otherwise known as our research hypothesis, is that aggressive kids generate fewer effective solutions than non-aggressive kids. And so stated in symbols, we would say that mu one is less than mu two. That is, at a population level, our aggressive kids, who are one, population one, generate fewer solutions on average than our non-aggressive kids, who are population two. So mu one, we're hypothesizing that at a population level, mu one is less than mu two. Our null hypothesis is that aggressive kids generate the same or even more effective solutions as non-aggressive kids. Okay, so that mu1 would actually be greater than or equal to mu2. Okay. It's important with our, uh, just to point out something that with our hypotheses, there's a comparison, a comparison between the two groups. So that aggressive kids generate fewer effective solutions than non-aggressive kids. So there's the very explicit comparison between group one and group two. And that's also found in the null hypothesis that aggressive kids generate the same or more effective solutions, you could say as or than non-aggressive kids. So it's important to specify both groups in the hypothesis. The second step is to determine the characteristics of the comparison distribution. For our independent t-test, we've got more steps here than we did before, so we're gonna go through them. All right, so we know that the mean of our comparison distribution is zero, okay? Um, I went through the logic of that, but I'll do it one more time. The idea is that on average, if we're selecting any random mean from population one and any random mean from population two, if under the null hypothesis, they come from populations with the same mean, then, then those random means should also be the same and so then we take the, when we take the difference between those random means, that difference should be zero, okay? So our distribution of mean differences should be centered around a mean of zero, okay? Under the null hypothesis, we're expecting zero difference between our two means, 
but what about the standard deviation? Okay. So the idea here is that even if the null hypothesis is true, because we're working with samples and a sample is fewer people than the entire population, just randomly, sometimes we're going to get means that when we subtract them are not perfectly equal to zero. Even if the null hypothesis is correct, we would expect that sometimes you get uh, means that are, that are different than each other. But just how different should we expect for them to be? Like what would be an average difference that would not be unusual? That's what we're determining with the standard deviation of our distribution of mean differences. Okay, that's what a standard error is. The standard error is nothing more than the standard deviation of that distribution. So there's several steps involved to figure that out. The first thing we need to do is figure out the estimated population variances. So I've already done that for you, we just or I've just given you the numbers. But this would come from you know what is called the raw data. You'd have to take all 26 kids, calculate the um, uh, use our standard deviation, our variance and standard deviation formulas in order to uh, to come up with this estimate. And so it's based on sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. That's how we're going to get our estimate of population variance. But I've already done that for both of our groups. So once that's done, we need to figure out the pooled variance. Again, a pooled variance is nothing more than a weighted average of our two estimates. So rather than simply averaging these together, which we would get 11 if we just average them together, we're going to acknowledge that our samples are different sizes. Okay, So this sample is 26, this sample is 36. So we want to give our sample, our larger sample, we want to give that more weight. It's got more people in it, so that should be a better estimate of population variance than our first one. So here's our formula for doing that. What you can see is that each estimate of population variance is given a weight. And that weight essentially reflects the proportion of the, the, uh, the total sample that each, each one of our groups represents. So like the proportion of the percent of the total. Right. So that's our weighting factor that we're going to apply to each of our estimate. So our estimate of population variance from sample 1 was 10. Our estimate of population variance from sample 2 was 12. Okay. So degrees of freedom 1 is 25. We got that by simply taking n minus 1 or 25 or 26 minus 1 to get 20 to, to get 25. Degrees of freedom 2, n minus 1. So 36 minus 1 is 35. Degrees of freedom total, we just get by summing together degrees of freedom 1 and degrees of freedom 2. So total degrees of freedom is 60. We got that by just adding 25 plus 35 to get 60. Okay. So that becomes our weighting, our weighting factor. So when we uh, do that and we take 25 divided by 60 multiplied by 10, we get 4.17. 4 35 divided by 60 times 12, we get 7. And then we add those together to get our pooled estimate of variance. So what you can see is that we've got an estimate that is pretty close to the simple average, but it's just a little bit closer to 12 because we've given more weight to that larger sample. So when you're doing this math, you should come up with a weighted average that is somewhere in between your two estimates. So if you got something that was like nine, or if you got something that was 13, you'd know that you were, you were off. Okay, so that's our weighted average. That's our pooled estimate of variance. So using our pooled estimate of variance, we're then going to use that to figure out the variance for each distribution of means. We do that using the same formula that we've been using this whole time. This comes from rule 2a. So we're going to take our, there we go, we're going to take our pooled estimate of variance, divide by sample size for sample 1. That gives us 0.43 is our estimate of the variance of the distribution of means 
that comes from population one. We're also going to use the same cooled estimate of variance divided by n, in this case is 36. So that gives us a slightly different estimate of the variance of the distribution of means that comes from population two. What's the difference? Why do we see a, a larger variance here and a smaller variance here? It's because our sample size is different. Okay, so in general, we have less error, okay, less spread in this distribution of means because our random sampling process is based on a larger sample size. All right, so we've got those two estimates of variance for each of those distribution of means, and then we're gonna add those together. And this is gonna give us the variance of the distribution of mean differences. And we can just add these together based on the variance sum law. Okay, now that we've got the variance of the distribution of mean differences, we're gonna take the square root to get the standard error of that mean difference. And we do that by just taking the square root. So that's the same basic principle that we've used before, is that in order to get a standard error, we have to take the square root of the variance of that distribution. Okay, previously, it was just a distribution of means. Now we have a distribution of mean differences, but we're ultimately gonna get a standard error by taking the square root of the variance of that distribution. Okay. And that's the number that we need for our T formula. Okay, next we're gonna determine a critical value. To do this, we need to determine our degrees of freedom, our desired significance level, and then whether we're gonna conduct a one-tail or a two-tail test. First, to get degrees of freedom, we're gonna use the overall degrees of freedom, and so this, or, or the total. And so we get this by summing together our degrees of freedom for group one, our degrees of freedom for group two, and adding those together to get our total degrees of freedom. We're gonna do a one-tail test, and we're gonna set alpha at 0 0.05. Why are we doing a one-tail test? Because we had a directional hypothesis. We predicted that aggressive kids would generate fewer solutions than non-aggressive kids. So all we need to do is look up the appropriate value in the t-table. It's our same t-table, by the way, so that hasn't changed. All right, so I've had to, there's many lines in our t-table, but I just went down to 60 degrees of freedom. We're using a one-tailed test, alpha 0 0.05. So we've got a t-value of 1.67. Now, we have to think about do we want to have a positive 1.67 or a negative 1.67? We have to ask ourselves, what side of the distribution are we looking on? Part of this has to do with how we're, what we're calling population one and what we're calling population two. Population one is our aggressive kids. Population two is our non-aggressive kids. We're going to calculate our T statistic as mean one minus mean two. So if mean one is the aggressive kids and mean two is the non-aggressive kids, and we predicted that the aggressive kids should, should generate fewer effective solutions, we're predicting that mean one is going to be less than mean two. Therefore, when we subtract mean one minus mean two, we're expecting a negative value for our t-test. We're expecting um, a negative t. So we're going to have set up our critical value as a negative um, 1.671. Okay. okay. Right. So negative. All right. Then we need to figure out our sample score on the comparison distribution. We do that by looking at the difference between mean 1 and mean 2, divided by that standard error of the difference that we calculated. That gives us a T of negative 3.49. We're going to decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. Our T, which was negative 3.49, is more extreme than our cutoff value that we came up with, which was negative 1.67. And therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. Again, anytime our T exceeds our critical value in the expected direction, we're going to reject the null. So what does it mean? Well. If we reject the null, 
we're going to conclude that these data are supportive of our alternative hypothesis, which is that yes, in fact, aggressive kids do generate fewer effective solutions than non-aggressive kids. And what we would conclude is that a difference between means this large is unlikely to happen by chance if there really is no difference between the two groups. Okay, that, that, that must be due to some real difference between the two groups at, at a population level. So, okay, so therefore it's likely that the two populations have different means and that aggressive kids generate significantly fewer solutions than non-aggressive kids.